When discerning if Muhammad was a true prophet, it is important to consider his character. According to Muslims in the Quran, Muhammad is a beautiful pattern of conduct and an exalted standard of character. In fact, Muslims claim Muhammad was the final prophet of God for all mankind in all time. In light of this, when we examine the early Muslim sources, we should expect to find a Muhammad who is a moral ambassador of God. However, we actually discover countless abominable immoralities and examples of utter unnecessary ruthlessness in Muhammad's life. Muhammad is a man who married more women than his own revelations allowed. He married the wife of his own adopted son. After Muhammad lusted after his adopted son's wife because of seeing her scantily dressed, his adopted son then divorced her and Muhammad shortly thereafter married her, claiming this was ordained by God. Surah 3337 of the Quran mentions this episode, thus showing Muhammad believed his God supported this immorality, quote, Then when Zayd had dissolved his marriage with her, with the necessary formality, we joined her in marriage to thee, unquote. What a convenient revelation to suit Muhammad's desires. This is adultery according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5.32 says, Everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery." Unquote. But Muhammad, if he is a man for today, let me ask you, why is it he married a girl who was only six and then consummated when she was nine and he was 53 years old? What did he do to the Jews in Medina? Look at what he did. He didn't even come from Medina. He came from Mecca. He moved to Medina in 622. By 624, he started confronting the Jews that were living there. And he threw out the Banu Kainu, the family, in the first year, uh, 624. A year later, in 625, he threw out the Banu Nadir family. In 627, he took all 800 men of the Banu Qurayza family, gave them spades, had them dig their own trenches, and then slit their throats and let them fall into the trenches. 800 men in one afternoon. Is this a man that's... A model for today do you really want to follow a man like that see I'd rather come back to Jesus Christ you want a man who is for today come back to Jesus he never let us ever he didn't let anybody use he never used violence himself and even when violence was done against him the one time that the disciples came to his defense as he was being arrested there in the garden of Gethsemane Peter comes up and cuts off the ear of the servant that's arresting him what does Jesus do he takes the ear, puts it back on the servant, turns toward Peter, and says, Put away your sword, for he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Matthew 26, verse 52. Ooh, I love my Jesus. In the law of God, we're told that people are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and that we are also to love our neighbor as ourselves. This, Jesus said, for example, is the first and second greatest commandment of the law. Muhammad can be seen to have fundamentally violated this in any number of ways. Uh, we even see in the Islamic literature that Muhammad is uh, granted such an authority that he can even make the boast that he stipulated the terms or conditions of a covenant with Allah and that Allah was not to transgress this. This is a fundamental violation of everything uh, biblical insofar as God is always the one who makes covenants and imposes them on people. People don't have the right to uh, stipulate the terms of a covenant and impose them on God and say that he has to follow them or else. And yet, uh, just to give an example of this in the Hadith literature, we're told in numerous Hadith that Muhammad would act often lose his temper and in the course of this he would end up cursing or even beating someone. And one particular case we're told uh, Muhammad saw a slave girl, an orphan girl, and he cursed her. When her caregiver found out about this, she came to Muhammad and asked him what this was all about, and Muhammad smiled at her. And then he, he said this, he says, Do you not know that I made a covenant or a condition, a term with Allah, that whoever I curse, you know, if they don't deserve it, then Allah is supposed to make it a source of blessing for that person. So you see what's going on here. It's it's not simply that Muhammad is saying, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be okay. If this person didn't deserve it, that's all right, because Allah is going to bless that person. 
What actually is going on here is in the course of covering his tracks for why he would do this sort of pernicious evil, Muhammad actually tells us that he made a covenant, he stipulated conditions or a term that Allah was not to transgress. This is the height of arrogance, and it's an arrogance not simply in vaunting oneself over and against somebody that uh, has greater authority than you, but in this case, the God of the universe, the God who made heaven and earth, Muhammad and all creatures, and yet here's one of his creatures pretending to be in a position to uh, dictate things to God. This same story also illustrates the immorality of Muhammad on the horizontal level. The very fact that Muhammad had to bring in this explanation of Allah blessing those Muhammad wrongly curses shows that Muhammad was immoral. He was given to uh, annoyance and fits of rage and outbursts, intemperate outbursts, uh, even against uh, poor orphan girls. Muhammad claimed the angel Gabriel gave him extreme sexual power and that people in heaven will have even more. In Ibn Sa'd's early 9th century biography of Muhammad, we read, quote, The Apostle of Allah said, Gabriel brought a kettle from which I ate, and I was given the power of sexual intercourse equal to forty men. Also, quote, The Apostle of Allah was given the power equal to that of forty men, and the people of paradise will be given the power equal to eighty men, unquote. Things like this show Islam is the product of a depraved 7th century desert man, as opposed to a holy god. He had sex with his slave girls. He supported idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba. Um, he assassinated people for criticizing his religion. He executed people for making fun of him. He told his followers that women are stupid and that their testimony is unreliable. He tortured people for money. He supported his religion by robbing people. He preached a message of violence and cruelty, and he taught his followers to believe in a God who loves only them and no one else. This is the ideal pattern of conduct, according to chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran. According to Quran 434, Muhammad allowed Muslim men to beat their wives, quote, but those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. However, Muslim apologist Mustafa Zaid claims the original Arabic word merely means beat them lightly. This is false. The original Arabic word is wajra bahuna, and according to John Penrus, its primary meaning is simply, quote, to beat, strike, unquote. Moreover, the following scholarly Quran translations of this verse say beat, scourge, or strike, as opposed to beat lightly. Also, the following Quranic commentators translate the word as beat, as opposed to beat lightly. Quranic scholar and commentator Alama Usmani says this verse means a man can beat his wife as hard as he wants as long as he doesn't break her bones or cause a scar. Now, in Sahih Bukhari, we read about a Muslim man beating his wife, quote, When Allah's messenger came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. According to this hadith, Muhammad did not chastise the man at all for beating his wife. Instead, he sided with the husband concerning their dispute. Also, in the following hadith, Muhammad's wife Aisha recalls an event concerning Muhammad and her, quote, Muhammad struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, unquote. In fact, Abu Bakr seems to have learned similar behavior from Muhammad. For, in Sahih Bukhari, we read, Narrated Aisha, Abu Bakr came towards me and struck me violently with his fist and said, You have detained the people because of your necklace but I remained motionless as if I was dead lest I should awake Allah's apostle, although that hit was very painful. What is more, in one hadith, Muhammad found it hilarious when his father-in-laws Abu Bakr and Umar slapped and abused various women, including his, that is Muhammad's, own wives. Quote, he, Hadrat Umar, said, I would say something which would make the prophet laugh, so he said, 
Messenger of Allah, I wish you had seen the treatment meted out to the daughter of Khadija when she asked me some money, and I got up and slapped her on the neck. Allah's apostle laughed and said, They around me, as you see, asking for extra money. Abu Bakr then got up and went to Aisha and slapped her on the neck, and Umar stood before Hafsa and slapped her, saying, You ask Allah's messenger which he does not possess. They said, By Allah, we do not ask Allah's messenger for anything he does not possess. Muhammad also said, A man will not be asked as to why he beat his wife. This saying is also attested in the following source. Lastly, in his tafsir, the 12th century Islamic scholar al Shari notes Muhammad as saying, Hang the whip so your wives can see it. There's so much about Sharia law that just is not relevant for today. And if you have any doubt, just take a look at ISIS. ISIS is probably the best example of Sharia law today because what ISIS is doing, what Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the man who is leading ISIS, the, the, the leader of ISIS, he is going right back to the Quran, right back to the traditions, applying Sharia law as the prophet, his prophet did it. And it comes straight out of this book. And that's why it is so barbaric. That's why they are cutting off the heads of the prisoners. And that's right in Surah 47, Ayah 4. That's why they're crucifying. That's in Surah 4. That's why they're beating the wives. That's in Surah 4, Ayah 34. That's why they're cutting off the hands of thieves. That's in Surah 5, Ayah 38. And I could go on and on and on and on. It is barbaric. It is not relevant for today. It doesn't work. It eradicates my freedoms. That's why I don't want Sharia law today. It just doesn't make sense. Bring me back to that which Jesus gave in his example. That does make sense. And I say this all the time. Keith, I tell people, can you show me one thing that's irrelevant with Jesus Christ? And I've said that for 33 years. I've asked that question. In 33 years, I've yet to find anybody that can find anything wrong with Jesus. So if you want the best law, the best example, the best model, the best paradigm, come on back to Jesus. We've got him. Come on home. Muhammad allowed his followers to do muta. When Muhammad's soldiers were in battle and away from their wives and became desirous and impassioned, they sought Muhammad's advice. Muhammad's allegedly inspired solution from God was that they should engage in muta marriage. Muta marriage is a temporary marriage contract with a woman for the purpose of sex that would be quickly annulled after the man's sexual desires were taken care of. Bukhari reports, narrated Abdullah, we used to participate in the holy battles led by Allah's apostle, and we had nothing, no wives with us. So we said, shall we get ourselves castrated? He forbade us that, and then allowed us to marry women with a temporary contract, and recited to us, O you who believe, make not unlawful the good things which Allah has made lawful for you, but commit no transgression. Quran 587, unquote. Muhammad allowed the rape of female war captives while their husbands were alive and present. This is taught in Quran 424, quote, Also prohibited are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess, unquote. The historical background about the giving of this verse is found in the following hadith. Abu Sayyid al-Qudri said, The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autos on the occasion of the Battle of Hunain, they met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands, who were unbelievers. So Allah, the Exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. This is clearly rape since the Muslim is allowed to have sex with a captive woman while her husband is still alive and present. No sane woman would want to have sex with a warrior who just killed her tribesmen and while her husband was still present. Thus, such sex can be said to be rape. The true God hates rape and would never permit this. Deuteronomy 22:25 says, but if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed, and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die." Unquote. Muhammad sucked the tongues of the sons of his companions, which is immoral and perverted. Quote, 
Muwiya said, I saw the Prophet sucking on the tongue or the lips of Al-Hasan, son of Ali. For no tongue or lips that the Prophet sucked will be tormented by hellfire. Also in a Bukhari hadith we read, Then he, Muhammad, said, Where is the little one? Call the little one to me. Hassan came running and jumped into his lap. Then he put his hand on his beard. Then the Prophet opened his mouth and put his tongue in his mouth. Then he said, O oh Allah, I love him, so love him and the one who loves him." Unquote. Now to save face, some Muslims read into the text the idea that this had to do with dehydration, but there is no evidence of this in the text. And if the boy was dehydrated, why was he running around excited, jumping in Muhammad's lap? Muhammad enjoyed making old women cry for fun. In Ibn Kathir's Life of the Prophet Muhammad, an old woman asked Muhammad to pray she would make it to paradise. Instead, he told her there would be no old women in paradise. She walked away crying. Later, as he laughed, he told one of his companions to go tell her what he meant was she would not be old in paradise, but turned into a virgin. Thus, Muhammad enjoyed seeing old women cry in fear of not making it to heaven. Muhammad lured converts with promises of women with swelling breasts in heaven. Quran 78, 31-33 says, Verily, for the pious is a blissful place, gardens and vineyards, and girls with swelling breasts of the same age as themselves." Unquote. Rather than a description of a holy paradise with Almighty God, this sounds more like some sort of celestial brothel imagined up by a depraved 7th century desert nomad. Moreover, Muhammad invented more convenient revelations along with the one we already mentioned, involving him marrying his adopted son's wife. For example, at first Muhammad would give his wives equal attention on separate nights, but then afterwards he began to favor certain wives, and Quran 3351 was then conveniently revealed to him which says, Thou mayest defer the turn of any of them that thou pleasest, and thou mayest receive any thou pleasest. And there is no blame on thee if thou invite one of those turn thou hadst set aside." Unquote. Muhammad's wife Aisha, keen on what was taking place, then said the following in response, quote, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. Unquote. Moreover, one night it was Hafsa's turn to be with Muhammad but she had to go somewhere. Muhammad therefore decided to instead have intimate relations with one of his slave girls he was not married to in Hafsa's bed, namely Mary the Copt. Hafsa found out and she was very upset. In response, Muhammad claimed Quran 66.1 was revealed to him in order to justify his behavior. It says, quote, O Prophet, why do you ban for yourself that which Allah has made lawful to you? seeking to please your wives. Then Muhammad claimed Quran 66 3-5 was revealed to him, which was a stern rebuke of Aisha and Hafsa for being upset with Muhammad for his actions with Mary the Copt. These are but a few of Muhammad's convenient revelations. How do they square up with Muhammad's other claim that the Quran is eternal and meant for all peoples and times, if much of it was meant to merely serve Muhammad's desires? Not only was Muhammad incredibly immoral, but so were his companions and his first successors of the Islamic State, that is, the Caliphs. If Jesus' disciples acted the way Muhammad's companions acted, Christians would never hear the end of it. The fact is, Muhammad's cousin and close companion, Ibn Abbas, who was praised by Muslims as one of Islam's greatest commentators of the Quran, was actually a very wicked man. When Caliph Ali appointed him as governor of Basra, Iraq, Ibn Abbas betrayed Ali and stole a large amount of money and provisions from the Muslim treasury for himself and left to go live in Mecca. Now, Muhammad's early followers also murdered each other in order to gain leadership over the Muslim people after Muhammad died. For example, after Muhammad's death, Uthman, the third Caliph, was assassinated by Egyptian Muslims and Abu Bakr's son, who supported Ali as the rightful caliph. Tabari reports, Muhammad b. Abi Bakr, Abu Bakr's son, came with 13 Egyptian men and went up to Uthman. He seized his beard and shook it until I heard his teeth chattering. 
Muhammad B. Abi Bakr said, Muawiyah was no help to you, nor was Ibn Amir, nor your letters. Uthman said, Let go of my beard, son of my brother. Let go of my beard. Then I saw Ibn Abi Bakr signaling with his eye to one of the rebels. He came over to him with a broad iron-headed arrow and stabbed him in the head with it. They gathered round him and killed him." Unquote. Then Ali became the fourth caliph. Now Muhammad's wife Aisha hated Ali for years because he accused her of being unfaithful to Muhammad, and thus she incited Muslims to fight against him. At the same time Talha and al-Zubair, companions of Muhammad, wanted Ali dead and did not recognize his succession as caliph. This resulted in the Battle of the Camel, where Aisha, Talha, al-Zubair, and thousands of Muhammad's followers, family, and friends fought Caliph Ali and the Muslims under his leadership. Thousands of Muslims died in the battle, but Ali was eventually victorious. Talha and Zubair were killed, while Aisha was arrested. Next, a relative of Muhammad and writer of the Quran who was close to Uthman named Muwiya accused Ali, the fourth caliph, of harboring the murderers of Uthman, the third caliph. This led to the Battle of Safain between Ali and Muwiya, where many Muslims died fighting each other. Then later a Muslim assassinated Ali and Muwiya proclaimed himself caliph. It is because of events like this that the Sunni vs Shiite split occurred leading to mutual hatred and fighting between them even to this day. The Shiites support Ali and side with him against Muhammad's other companions who fought him, while the Sunnis hate the Shiites for doing so.